Welcome to Wrestling With Heart, a podcast looking at pro wrestlers giving back to their community. Join me, Stanley Carr, as I interview wrestling's hottest names who use their platforms as entertainers to raise awareness and do community service. Hello and welcome to another edition of Wrestling With Heart. This is the podcast where we talk with professional wrestlers and professional wrestling personalities about their lives in and outside of the ring as well as doing acts of charity work, community service, volunteering, and spreading positivity. We're always about the positivity here on the show and with me right now I've got a very special guest. She has worked for Impact Wrestling and WWE, interviewer, backstage correspondent, multimedia superstar. I'm pleased to welcome the one, the only Mackenzie Mitchell to the program. Welcome Mackenzie. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. What an intro. That was awesome. Thank you. So let's get into it. Tell me about your childhood and upbringing. Where are you from? So I'm from Dexter, Missouri. It's a small town in Southeast Missouri. It's between Memphis and St. Louis, about two hours, two and a half hours from each. So 7,000 person town, maybe four stoplights. It's very small, but I'm very thankful for my childhood and growing up in such a small town in a small community where everyone is so supportive and, and appreciative. That's very nice. You know, everybody wants to root for each other, wants everybody to be successful and do well in life. So Dexter, Missouri. All right. So equal distance between St. Louis and Memphis. That's right. Let's talk about, um, you know, you've been in front of a microphone. It seems like almost all your life was, was being in the entertainment industry, something you wanted to do, something you knew you wanted to do growing up. Yes, actually. So ever since I can remember, um, I had had, I've had a microphone in my hand, whether it was performing on stage, I did pageantry. Um, I sang in front of 10,000 people when I was at the age of six. So I've always knew I loved being in the spotlight and loved performing. I signed with a modeling agency when I was just five years old. So I've always been in front of the camera. That's where I feel comfortable. So for me, it was just, I knew, I knew I wanted to do something to perform. I didn't know what it was going to be. I always loved to, to dance and to cheer and to sing and to speak on camera. And so for me, that it was just kind of a natural fit. Um, when I went to college at the University of Mississippi, I started off originally going to school for physical therapy. I thought that's something I wanted to do in the medical field. My dad's a dentist. And so I thought I wanted to kind of venture into that path. And I'll just tell you, the science and the math were not for me. I'm way better at English and, and spelling and talking and being on camera and journalism than I am in the math and science, science mm -hmm. fields. So I immediately transitioned my freshman year right into journalism um, and had a really great time. It was, so, it was so easy. It felt natural for me, obviously, with my, my history and my childhood and upbringing. Um, and I, I got the opportunity to work with the University of Mississippi as their on-camera host at their baseball, basketball, football games for four years. So I was their MC, and I really got my feet wet and got some true experience before I transitioned into a later career in professional wrestling. Wow, that's so amazing, you know, going through all those things and journalism. So tell me about some of your experiences uh, taking those classes, because I'm sure there were some pieces of advice that you got early on that really stuck with you. So actually, my first journalism class was Journalism 101. My professor was, I think her name was Millie Brown or some Millie, Miss Millie something is her last name. I can't remember. Um, and um, she, when we had done an exercise in the class to see, you know, just kind of under, understand who your classmates are and get to know each other. So we had to turn to our person beside us and ask them questions about themselves and then stand up and deliver what we learned to the class. And so for me, that was extremely easy. I was able to just conduct a quick interview. We had five minutes, find out all this information, stood up, delivered the information about my classmate to everyone else. And after the class, the teacher pulled me aside and said, I just want to let you know, you're a natural journalist. You might not know this yet, but you're in the right career path. You have a bright future in front of you. Um, and so that was really exciting. So young in my career as a freshman in college, freshman in college, right out of high school, it was just kind of reassurance for me. Um, and then of course, on the opposite side, you have your capstone classes, your very last class, my very last class that I took before I graduated. And you have to kind of get real with yourself. Some of the journalism, um, students that were among me 
the teacher had told us, you know, half of you guys in this class might not make it in the journalism field. And that's just the realities of, of life and how things work. So for me, I was really lucky to get the experience I did in college to have some true experience on camera, um, working with the university, and then also just finding a job right out of college. I was very, very lucky, obviously entering the professional wrestling world. That was such a dream um, job that's now taken me so many different places in my career. Do you remember any of the first pieces you remember writing or having in your brain thinking about writing? Um, so I actually wrote a feature piece on an older gentleman. Um, we called him Judge. He worked with the athletics program as well. And for years he would at Swayze Field, which is where the baseball, which is the baseball stadium is called at Ole Miss, um, he would be in charge of tickets. And so he's probably he had just passed earlier this year, unfortunately. Um, but he worked out in the ticket department and was there for probably 50 years. And so he was such a crucial part to the fans and to Ole Miss athletics. And so when we had to do a feature piece on someone in the community, he was a natural fit for me. And so still to this, I, I say still to this day, but he was so proud of that piece um, because it was such a meaningful experience for him that people got to see him and know him on a different level. Yes, every... Thursday night, Tuesday night, when people would come up to the game, they'd say, hey, Judge, how are you? But just getting to understand where he came from and his background um, was so rewarding for me to see how big of an impact it had on him and the community. Yeah, that's very nice. A hometown hero for sure. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned earlier you were an on-air host working for the athletics department for the games at, at Ole Miss. Uh, tell me about that experience. That seems like a lot of fun. I was really lucky. There was only one host, an MC, that got chosen for this position with the University of Mississippi's athletics. And so as a college, as a college student, I was trying to get my broadcast degree. Um, I worked, I did double time. So I was going to school, but I was also working with the athletics program. Um, and so I always like to say that I was an athlete without being an athlete. My time commitment was just about, just about the same where I was at the field. I was at the stadium, um, the basketball arena. I was just, I was there as much time as they were, but on a different level on a different, um, in a different way. I was the voice, if you will, um, of the fans and of the university. And so I was able to just really connect with fans in Mississippi um, that were coming to the games on a weekly basis and some of the players and getting to understand them and just my fandom really increased for, for SEC sports when I was working at Ole Miss. And so I was really, really lucky to land that position and for the athletic department to believe in me then. Um, and like I said, it's just, it's, it's carved out, it helped carve out my, my career and my future early on in my career when I was still trying to get a broadcast degree. I'm really, really lucky to land that position. Yeah. Were there any fun stories? I know you'd mentioned one with the, the guy I did a piece on, but were there any, any other fun memories you care to share from your time at Ole Miss? Definitely. So when I was there, um, Ole Miss had beat Alabama. I don't know how mm -hmm. deep dive you are in, in SEC sports, but the rivals. Exactly. Alabama mm -hmm. is kind of, they're a powerhouse. They're really hard to beat in SEC with Nick Saban. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it was a home game. And I want to say it was my senior year. Um and Ole Miss beat Alabama. I was down on the field and I remember the the security and some of the staff that were around on the field. And they said, whenever they win, if they win, if this goes through and you know, the buzzer goes off, be aware because they're the fans are coming over. They're jumping over the top of, of the, the railing to get down on the field. Sure enough, the buzzer goes off fans, just like popcorn, just start coming over the field <laughs> onto the field. And so you just were kind of like trying to get your surroundings, get your bearings. Um, but we celebrated and we had so much fun. And there's an iconic photo of that. Mm -hmm. um, some of my friends actually carrying the goalpost out of the stadium. It's it ended up, I think, in the middle of the, of the town. And it was just such a fun experience and something I will never forget being at Ole Miss. That was just that was just a fun and cool experience for me. And definitely when you're in an arena or a stadium full of fans, I mean, that definitely would help prepare you for what would come later with professional Absolutely. wrestling. 
Absolutely. Now, when you made that transition, how did, how did you get the job with Impact? Did you Were you a fan growing up or was that something that just you got a, an offer? Tell me about how you got the job with Impact. So I wasn't a fan growing up. Um, I had never really watched professional wrestling. My family, my aunt had been a fan back when she was growing up in the 70s and 80s. Um, but I never was, I was never a fan. And then when I graduated from the university, I had spoke to my athletic director at the time. And I, he said, what do you want to do when you graduate? And I, I didn't really know. I wanted to work in sports, entertainment, or music. And I didn't know what that was exactly, but I knew I wanted to live in Nashville. I love Nashville, Tennessee. It's got such a special place in my heart. Um, so at the time TNA was their home base that when they were centered out of Nashville. So I was really lucky before I graduated to have a couple meetings with some executives at TNA um, with Dixie Carter and be able to talk with them and see if it was for me. And they actually wanted me to start with TNA before I was even graduated from the university. And I'm like, hold on, pause, time out, got to get a broadcast degree and then I'll check back in May. So I started right out of college. As soon as I graduated, the next week I moved to Nashville and began my journey in professional wrestling. Wow. And the rest, as they say, is history. I yeah. mean, was it? were you nervous at first making that transition? Because professional wrestling, I mean, obviously there's some similarities with professional sports, with, with the basketball and baseball and all that, but it's a whole different ball game. No pun of intended. Course. I was very, I was very nervous. I had a lot to learn. Um, I had no idea what I was jumping into, but I jumped in head first and just kind of didn't turn back. Um, I really loved my experience at TNA. I, it was a growing experience. It was a learning experience. Like I said, I knew, I knew really nothing. And so I really leaned into Drake Maverick who helped me quite a bit. He was rockstar spud at TNA. Um, and some others in the office that really just helped me help educate me and really get to know what professional wrestling is. Um, and I would do my own homework, of course, like I would watch hours of YouTube videos. I would, I was writing articles for the website. So I was getting my own experience and my own knowledge, my own knowledge then of just by researching the web and figuring out, watching hours of pay-per-views, old TNA, um, and just understanding who the superstars are, who the characters were and what they believed in and what they stood for. So I did a lot of back work before I was able to feel comfortable on camera, if you will. Um, and it was also too just kind of a trial and error situation for me. I was on camera and doing live interviews and not really knowing what I'm even talking about in my early days, but knowing I'm going to get so much experience and gain so much from this. I remember doing a Facebook Live with Jeff Hardy. I had an old manager at the time at TNA that said, the only way you're going to learn is just getting out there and just trying it, just seeing what you can do. When the red light goes on, what can you do? Um, and I was absolutely terrified. It's Jeff Hardy. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, yeah. And so for me, um, I made my way through it and I learned so much and grew so much from my time at TNA. And I'm really, really thankful for the years that I had in TNA because it allowed me to make mistakes and allowed me to develop connections and relationships with superstars like Chelsea Green and Ellie Knight and um, Meechin and Bobby Lashley and the Hardy brothers, like the list goes on of who all I was able to work with there. So I'm really, really thankful for my time that I had there. Yeah. I mean, getting to work with all those names who eventually made it big in the WWE, you know, it's, it's so cool to see how they were able to follow you and you followed them to bigger and better things. Um, but you had mentioned Drake Maverick earlier. Was there any pieces of advice that he gave to you when you started out that still stuck with you? Yeah, absolutely. When I was starting, like I said, he would just kind of lead me. And there's so much about professional wrestling. If you're coming in as an outsider that you just don't even know the lingo, you don't know the language, you don't even know what you're talking, what people are talking about. And so I remember there was some, there was some sort of match. I don't exactly remember what it was, but I was just beyond confused. I was like, explain to me how this works. How did this go down? Why did this happen? And it, he had said to me then, if there's ever an instance that you need clarification on, come to me. I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to shoot you straight. And I'm going to tell you exactly 
you know, what it is and educate you and tell you how, because there's a lot of people in wrestling that um, coming as an outsider in that may have judged me or may have had a preconceived notion of who I was, but he never did that. He was always just very honest and true and wanted me to grow and wanted me to learn. Mm -hmm. So I was really, really thankful for his friendship really early on because sometimes you don't find that and it's more criticism and judgment instead of just helpful um, and going hand in hand in things. Yeah, but you your confidence grew. You got, you know, you got better over time. And then now what happened exactly? Did you leave TNA on your own and then WWE called? What what happened there? I did. Um I you know, I feel like a lot of times in life, one door has to close for another to open. I think that that's so true and it, it sounds cliché, it does, but for me, I always, once I was in TNA, I wanted to get to WWE. It was a dream of mine. I'd, I'd worked so hard to get to TNA and felt like I really understood the business and I understood kind of where I wanted to go with things. Um, and so for me, it was just, it was time for me to start a new chapter and I knew I wanted to get to WWE. And so I'd moved to Los Angeles at the time. My conversation that I had with some executives in TNA was about in January. Um, and we'd spoke and I just said, you know, I think it's time for me to go in a different direction right now. It's nothing personal. It's just how I'm feeling and where I want my career to go. And so I put my week, my two weeks in and then worked that pay-per-view, moved on. And it was in June of that, that year that I got hired by WWE. And I actually applied for the position online, wwecareers.com. I went on and applied just like a normal everyday human would trying to get into wrestling. Mm -hmm. Um and it was funny. I remember my first conversations whenever they gave me a call to see if I wanted to have a tryout or come back with WWE. They asked me if I knew anything about wrestling. And I'm like, did you did you read my my resume? I'd worked at TNA for four years. Of course, I know things about wrestling. I, I, I understand the business. I've been on live television talking about professional wrestling. Um, and so, yeah, I was really it was it was everything happens for a reason for me making the jump to just say and putting my two weeks in in January and then getting hired that following June, not even six months later. So it was really kind of a, a synergy thing for me. Yeah. And I know that I was, I was watching this interview that you did and you were talking about how you did a lot of work for the digital media department before being a part of NXT. What was that like? It was great. Um, I came in with all of the original bump cast. So the Matt camp, um, I can't even remember Evan Mack. Um, Kayla came over at the time where she was doing SmackDown, but she was also doing the bump stuff as well. And I was their designated breaking news girl on the set for the bump. But I also was doing WWE Now. Um, that was kind of my that was my bread and butter in the offices. So every Friday, every Monday, I was breaking down what you could see on Raw or SmackDown. And then when it comes to the pay-per-views, I was kind of doing the recaps and the previews and all of those things in the office. There was a lot of work to do there. Um, and I love my experience in the offices. It was so fun to just be in the headquarters and where all the magic happens in Connecticut. And so I really loved my time there. Yeah. And then eventually you got moved to NXT. Uh, I enjoyed watching you every Tuesday uh, interviewing so many people. You're welcome. So many people um, that had to have been a thrill for you to get that call up because it's just an amazing feeling uh, working for one of the big brands in WWE. Well, I tell you like, I always felt comfortable doing television, starting an impact and doing television right out of the gates, out of college. That was kind of what I've learned from the beginning was interviewing, um, how to be a great backstage interviewer and how to kind of mediate those conversations. That's where I feel most comfortable. So whenever I was able to make the jump over to NXT, I just felt at home. I really did because it was, I knew what it was. I knew what the backstage interviews felt like. I know what those conversations are like and how they run. Um, and so I loved making that jump to NXT from the offices in Connecticut. To you, Mackenzie, what makes a good interviewer? I really think you need to listen. Um, there's several things. I, I guess I should revert and say there's several things that makes a good interviewer. But for me, it's really listening to what your guest is having to say. I think a lot of the times people get caught up in what's on a piece of paper or what they've already have in their mind to say. And if a conversation goes one way and you're not able to follow it, 
because you're so stuck on something else that you want to ask, that's when there's there's missing pieces of the puzzle. You know what I mean? That's mm-hmm. where those conversations sometimes could really magic could be made if you just follow what your guest is saying. So for me on air with NXT, that was always what I wanted to do is, yes, we all know there is some kind of script. There is some kind of idea of where you want to go with the conversation. Um, But for me, it was always sometimes we would ad lib on the fly and things would be said. And then we'd go, I would just play off of people. That's kind of how you you have to be able to respond in real time. Um, And I really think for me, Things that something that set me apart in my career was my nonverbal. It's how do you respond in an interview without saying anything at all? Because sometimes as an interviewer, you have five seconds to ask, what are your thoughts? How are you feeling? How did you what were what are you what were you expecting out of this match or whatever? But it's the response. It's that it's that nonverbal emotion that you're showing through your face that allows a fan to watch without the to, without the noise, without the volume on, and be able to connect to you on another level. Yeah, I mean, just watching some of your interviews that you you've done with the likes of Grayson Waller, Wes Lee, Toxic Attraction. I mean, that's really good chemistry. I mean, and you, the fact that your your ad libbing skills were incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what have been some of your favorite interviews that you've done? You mentioned Toxic Attraction. Um. I loved working with Mandy and Gigi and JC. We just had so, we had so much fun. And I know at one point people were joking two different sides. They were like, well, Mackenzie and Mandy, it looks like they're going to actually have a fight. And then on the second side, it was like, Mackenzie could be part of toxic attraction. Like it just kind of felt, it felt, it felt right. Um, But I loved working with those girls. We had so much fun together um, on screen because we can bounce off of each other. You mentioned Grayson Waller. I loved working with Grayson because it was natural. So we would have an idea of what we'd want to go with what we want to say. But then when the red light would come on, how we would play off of each other was all just what that was how we were as people. Um, and so we really, I feel like, fueled each other's fire there. And the chemistry, like you said, was was great. And of course, Wesley, like I, I still talk to Wes today. Um, he actually messaged me. I want to say a couple weeks ago and ironically in his locker was the last interview that we did together. It was the my last ever interview in WWE. And it was so strange because I don't know. I mean, that was over a year. I mean, nearly a year ago. And so I'm like, why is that still in your locker? Number one, like, where did that come from? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it was just a very interesting day. It was a, it was an interesting conversation that he sent me that I found this in my locker, just thinking about you. Um, and we still just, we still chat as friends because we are friends. And so what you were seeing in that dynamic that you were seeing on camera was just true chemistry and just our friendship coming to life. Professional wrestling is such a brotherhood and sisterhood. You know, you make all these different friends over the course of your time there. And then when things unfortunately happen, you know, you get released. I mean, that that had to have been hard, you know, when you got released from WWE. Yeah, you know, it, it was. Um, furthermore on that, like my husband still works for NXT with mm-hmm. Joseph. And so mm-hmm. we had came up with kind of a routine of thing of, of what we do on Tuesdays. We get up, we get ready, um, we go to work, I'd get makeup. Like there was a kind of a, a routine that we came up with and comfortability factor of being the voices of NXT, me being backstage, him being out ringside. Um, and so that was kind of a shift. That was a, a really strong dynamic shift in our lives personally and professionally. But I also like to say in your time um, that you are working with whatever company company it is, it is a brotherhood and sisterhood. Um, but at the same time, you know your true friendships with people after something like a release happens because you are able to really, you still talk to him. Like I said, I still talk to Wes. I still talk to Chelsea Green. I still talk to Sean L.A. Knight. Like there, you still have those true friendships that are forever friendships. Mm-hmm. Um you really get to find out who people are outside of professional life when something like this happens, like a release. Yeah. Did you and Vic meet at NXT? We met in WWE. It wasn't NXT. He was calling Raw at, at the time, and I was still in the office in Connecticut. 
Um, and so we met backstage and it was, I knew there was something different about him. I didn't know what it was and he was missing meetings to try to talk to me. And I didn't know that. And then a month or about a week later, he DM'd me on social media. And then we went on our first date a month later and then the rest was history. We were together basically every week, every weekend after that. Um, and so we're, we, we had a really awesome experience to meet each other in WWE and then be able to work in the same role in the same company and then um, obviously get married. And so, yeah, it, I, it's just, yeah, we had a great, we had a great time there together. Yeah. I mean, you were just really good uh, doing what you, what you do. And I, I hope someday down the road, they bring you back because you were incredible. Uh, Thank did you, you. You're welcome. Now, if you could think about your ultimate dream uh, moment that you want to have in, in professional wrestling, it could be in WWE or TNA or any company, what would that be? Definitely WrestleMania. Um, I've said this, I think, before in the past as well. It's just I never got to have my WrestleMania moment. Um, I love with that said, I love NXT. I absolutely love NXT. Um, it always felt like home to me, working under the likes of Shawn Michaels um, with executive writer Johnny Russo. Um, they are like family. They truly are. And so for me, NXT has always been where I felt so comfortable. Um, but with that, you, you dream of having those WrestleMania moments. And some might argue that WrestleMania is only for the superstars, only for the wrestlers. And I totally disagree with that. No. I think that there's so many people in the company from production to lighting to to backstage interviewers to writers like there's so many people that go unnoticed that go behind the scenes in WWE um that it's their chance to have their moment as well all of their hard work culminating to one weekend and so for me that's something I would always I always dream about is having a WrestleMania moment, being on WrestleMania, whether that's a kickoff show or a panel or just having my backstage interview. Um, that's something for me particular in professional wrestling. I'd still like to do. Yeah. I think that backstage interviewers in, in my opinion are just as important to the show as the superstars. I mean, you think about mean Gene Okerlund and right. Jonathan Coachman, Renee Paquette. I mean, they're just as vital to the product as the wrestlers are. So I definitely could see a moment like that for you in the future. Thank you. We hope so. Never say never, right? Never say never. Now you've also been involved. I was doing some research. You've been involved recently with this wrestling musical. Tell me about that. That's really interesting. It was probably <clears throat> the coolest experience I've ever been a part of. It was called The Last Match Musical. Um, it's professional wrestling meets rock music meets musical theater, which is something that all of those three things, wouldn't you wouldn't expect them to go in one full sentence and one full show. Um, and so it was a really fun, cool experience working beside Mickey James and Simon Miller um, and some of the actors that also played the roles that stepped up, that learned to wrestle in just two and a half weeks before we went on tour. Um, it was so fun. And we developed such a bond and such a friendship. All of us um, across the board, we just had such a great time. We were in rehearsals, um, I want to say for about two weeks in Jersey City. Then we went to Rochester, New York. We had a, a set, set spot there in Rochester for about two weeks. And then we went on tour and we were making the towns. We started in Vermont, Burlington, Vermont, and ended the tour in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and just the response from people across the board that, that watched the show, whether they were musical theater fans, rock fans, or professional wrestling fans, they absolutely loved the show. Um, and to get that feedback, because it's such a different, it's, it's got all of the elements of the things that we, I had mentioned, but just to get the feedback and see the smiles on people's faces at the end of the show, it was just magic. It was such a great time. What role did you play in the musical? So I was the play-by-play -play commentator. My name was Scarlett Sublime, um, and I was kind of leading the ship on the commentary desk with, with Strutt and Jimmy Sutton was my commentary partner. And Jeff is his real name. He was a, he's an actual circus clown. He's a clown. And so... He would bring those elements of the fun and the wit to it, um, while I, at the same time, was just kind of keeping the train on the tracks, and I was, like, doing the business. And so I learned a lot about commentary as well. Um, 
learning play by play and calling matches. And yes, we kind of knew every night what the main event match was going to be for the most part, but we'd have locals that would come into the musical. And so then the locals would have a match and just a real wrestling match. So I'd get to try my experience and try my hand there at calling wrestling. Um, and I surprised myself. I feel like I knew more than I thought that I knew. Obviously I have a learning tree to learn from in my husband and have you know, watched him and understood kind of how his process and his thinking works when it comes to play by play. But yeah, I, I really loved my role as Scarlet and it was such a great fun experience. You think we'll see you try commentary? Maybe. Hey, I'd like to. I think that would be really cool. Vic and I have actually talked about it and and I already am probably 30% in and learning the commentary play by play role. So why not just go ahead and learn it and go headstrong to it and learn the 100% and see what I can do with that. I definitely think you could make a great commentator. That'd be awesome. You. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. So before we switch gears here, I want to talk about your podcast that you have called Threads. I got to catch a couple of episodes. Really unique concept, just like our concept, Wrestling with Heart. Tell me about what made you want to pursue that. So I had had the idea for Threads for nearly five years. I'd pitched it to WWE. They weren't interested. Um, it just didn't stick. We never really made it happen. We filmed a pilot actually with Johnny Gargano last year, last February. I got released in December and it just didn't go anywhere. It just kind of sat there and didn't really do anything. But showing the the style and the fashion and the appeal side of a persona, of a character, was always something that I could relate to. I've never been in the ring, so I don't know what it feels like to take a bump and to, you know, all the falls, all the hits, to be in the ring and the analytical side of the moves. I don't know that, but I do know the style side and what, on what, you know, creates that superstar appeal for all of these superstars when they came, when they come out for Royal Rumble or WrestleMania and you're, they're wearing something outlandish, you're large, you're big or different. You're like, oh, that's cool. And I want to know more about it. So for me, I'd always had this idea to do this show called Threads and talk about iconic looks from iconic moments in the past. And it just, it's been so amazing to see fans across the world love the idea, love the concept, and also be able to relate to what I'm talking about and going, yeah, this, this is the conversation that's not being had. People aren't talking about their gear. And then even sitting down with the superstars, I just did an episode with Natalia and she said, you know, I've done thousands and thousands of interviews and I've never talked about my gear because it doesn't come up in conversation naturally. It's more about the accolades and the accomplishments and, and her family and what she's done in the ring. Um, but for me, I really like to shine light on those conversations and the money and the time and the effort that's spent in putting together an iconic look throughout the years um, and what made that look special that somebody that somebody might not know um, just by watching on television, but then getting to hear that story unfold. And you've also got a jewelry line too, headlines. Tell me about that. So my family's been in fine jewelry for 75 years. My great grandmother and great grandfather started a small jewelry store um, back in the 1950s in my small town of Dexter, Missouri. It still survives today by my grandmother and my aunt who run the store. Um, and so I always, like I've said, ha I'm very interested in style and fashion. And so it's my creative outlet. It's my way to design and come up with cool, creative ideas to be worn on camera, to be worn at a red carpet. They're, my, my jewelry is bold, edgy statement jewelry um, mm -hmm. that are, it's, it's been really rewarding too, to create these pieces and people love them and want to buy them, and want to wear them. So it's been really fun with Headline. Um, and threads and headline kind of go hand in hand, if you will. Yeah. Is there like a favorite piece of jewelry that you designed yourself that you feel like? So, is? Oh, yeah, I have a few. Um, my drippin' collection was my original brainchild. I have on my earrings today. They're like hoop earrings, but they oh, have wow. on them. Really um, nice. You've seen the drippin' necklace that I mm -hmm. designed on Seth Rollins, on Natalia, um, Chelsea Green, Roxanne Perez, Cora, G like the list goes, Mandy Rose, the list goes on. Yeah. Um, and so I've seen, so to have my friends support and wear my pieces and not just because I say like, hey, can you wear this? Can you promote them actually buying my jewelry, which has been so awesome. Um, so I, most importantly, I'm probably most most proud of my Drippin' collection. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Well, let's switch gears now and talk about the stuff that you've done outside of wrestling. I know throughout your time in WWE and in Impact, you've been involved with a lot of different uh, charity organizations, worked with numerous charity groups over the years. What things have you done to help out in your community? So actually my best friend, Ashley Snell, um, her husband is Tony Snell. They have a 501c, a nonprofit that helps kids on the spectrum, on the autism spectrum. Um, and so we have partnered with some jewelry when I talk about headline, um, some pieces that are really special and really important um, to the autism community. The symbol for autism awareness is the infinity sign. Mm -hmm. um, so we've created some pieces for autism specifically to be able to give back to the community and shine light and bring awareness to, to autism awareness. Um, and so we also came up with a spinner ring. I don't have it on today, but it's a, it's called the center stage spinner ring. And so it's a fidget spinner. So you put it on your index finger and you spin the fidget spinner. It's a way to kind of relieve stress and anxiety. And also a lot of kids, a lot of people on the spectrum, they need something to move. They need something to fidget with all of the time. And so that's been a piece that's just people have really loved um, and they've taken to because it's just a it's a different thought. It's it's meaningful. Um, so I'm really proud of the things that Headline and myself have done with the autism awareness with autism awareness, I should say. It's kind of interesting to create a piece of jewelry that represents something like autism awareness. I never thought about that before. Right. Yeah, it's been really, really amazing for us um, to to shine that light and to create pieces that are meaningful, that are functional, that are not just something you wear that's an accessory. It's, you know, it's speak, it's a accessory that speaks without speaking at all. Yeah. I mean, are there plans to do like fundraisers or benefits to help out with the, the autism awareness that supports your, uh, your company? So we actually just did one um, in April with Ashley Snell Collection and Ashley Snell and the Tony Snell Foundation, where we raised we raised money for a kids camp um, where kids from across Central Florida can come. And let's say that their family for the first time is learning that their kid is on the spectrum, that they have autism. And it's just um, I've learned from my friends that have kids on the spectrum that it's kind of a question mark. It's where do we go from here? What do we do with this knowledge? How do we how do we help? How do we figure out where we go. Um, and so the event in April actually raised $25,000 to be able to help put the camp on for kids. It was a partner, it was partnered with SeaWorld. Um, it was a fun day for kids that were on the spectrum and not on the spectrum to just kind of come and learn and resources with Advent Health to be able to help these kids understand and these parents have guidance of where did they go. Um, and so that was something I wasn't able to be part of the camp. I was on the musical tour, but I was able to help raise awareness and raise the money, the $25,000 that went into the camp in, in May. It was in May. Um, and then now there's a gala that's going to be going on in September, October to again, um, raise awareness, to get families involved, to help give back to a bigger, to something that's bigger than us. Wow. I mean, that's amazing to see what you're able to do and the progress that you're making with this. I mean, that's, it's got to feel good when you're giving back and helping out like this. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. It's, that's what it's all about, right? Is making people happy and making people smile and making a difference in people's lives. Yeah. I mean, you just never know what somebody's going through. And to you, why do you feel passionate about doing this? Um, about helping out? Yes. Um, you know, like I said, my friend Ashley Snell, her two sons are on the spectrum. Um, her husband as well. Tony Snell is actually, he's on the spectrum. And so I've really learned and understood their experiences through her. Um, and so when somebody is so close to you and you've learned a personal experience or you're able to help them fight the fight, you want to give back. You want to help other kids, other families in need. Um, and so for me, that's kind of my connecting factor is being, being able to help families um, and bring awareness to, to a bigger cause that, uh, that is autism awareness. Yeah. I mean, you had mentioned you got the, you have the gala going on and you had a fundraiser here. Do you have a, a timeline of where you hope to see this thing go in the next few years? Um, you know, it's just, it's day by day, really. It's kind of bringing awareness. And I think for the long period, the long-term goals is to create schooling. I know Ashley wants to create schooling that helps kids on the spectrum. That's a full-blown um, 
facility with educators and with resources and you learn that your kids on the spectrum, where do you go? It's hard, you know, when you don't know what the options are. Doctors give you this diagnosis and then you say, where do I go from here? Um, so I know her goal is to create a full facility here in Central Florida and then other places all over the United States so that families have a place to land. They have a place to, to go to and understand and grow. Yes. Well, that's very awesome. You know, I wish you the best of luck with that. I think that's going to be really good. Now, as far as you're welcome. Now, as far as wrestling and everything else is concerned, what's next? You know, I'm really loving doing my show threads. I'm having a great time getting to have those conversations to pull back the onion, if you will, talk about the different levels of those, those untold stories. Like I said, revealing, um, iconic looks from iconic moments and why they were special. So I'm really love, I, I really love doing that. Mackenzie, uh, this has been great getting the chance to speak with you. And I just want to say thank you for coming on the show. It means a lot to me, to my listeners and viewers. Where can people find more about you on social media and all the cool things you're doing? So on social, I'm Mackenzie in Mitchell. Um, across the board, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok there. And then you can find Threads with Mackenzie Mitchell on YouTube. And we're now on podcast. We're now on a podcast form. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Um, and then if you want to shop my jewelry business, you can go to headlinebymm.com and that's where you'll find all of my pieces or you can just connect everything through my social media on Mackenzie and Mitchell. All right. Now you had mentioned earlier you uh, had wanted to do music. Is that something we could hear from you in the future? Music. I don't know if I'm a, I don't know if I could do music. I used to sing when I was younger. Um, I think musical theater would kind of be a fun venture to go and be part of. Um, the last match, like I said, was that. And so never say never on that either. I had a really great time on that, but I don't think you'll see me playing any instruments. I'm not, I'm, I'm a little challenged when it comes to playing piano, guitar, or a musical instrument, but I used to be able to sing. So yeah, we'll never say never. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, Mackenzie, thank you again. And you're more than welcome to come back. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a great time. Yes. Take care. This is Wrestling With Heart. I hope you found this podcast to be informative and entertaining. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and look out for the next edition.